Knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. God commands that we speak words of life into his creation, not words of criticism. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. Hey, Happy New Year. This is, mm -hmm. of course, Quick Study Television, and you're, we're here in 2003. We're doing it again. Right from the beginning, Genesis 1 to 3 is our reading assignment today. We're going to end up this year with Revelation 22. It's going to be great. This year, focusing on wisdom, and we begin with what else but the mouth. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We're speaking, of course, of Genesis 2. It is the mouth that got everybody into trouble in the first place, the power of the mouth. And we're going to be focusing on that. Put a mouthwatch over your mouth, not mouthwash, mm -hmm. mouthwash. <laughs> mouthwash is after the problem has occurred. You want to get that mouthwatch beforehand. Also, Corey is with us with Bible Archaeology. Corey, what's up? Yes, well, today we are going to be thinking critically about the creation of the universe. And we're also going to be focusing in on the first sin. On Friday, we have the universal set being unveiled by Ryan in Cosmic Mysteries. So stick around for Friday. Mm -hmm. We also have a new segment. We do. What is it? It's called Did You Know? And there's a lot that we're going to know about the Bible by the end of this year. But for today, here's what I want to know. Do you know what the first metal is that's mentioned in the Bible? What a great question. The first metal mm -hmm. mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Corey's going to answer that for us later <laughs> on. Stay there as we continue. This year with our study in the first three chapters of Genesis, you and I are going to take a look at why understanding and knowing what you believe about these first few chapters of Genesis is crucial. The first 11 chapters of Genesis have been the center of controversy during this last century. These chapters deal with the creation of the universe and mankind, the first sin, early civilization, the global flood of Noah, its aftermath, and the Tower of Babel, explaining the mysterious origins of language. Within the last century, our society has undergone a major shift in the way we view our world due to the popular acceptance of the theory of evolution. Some of these fundamental shifts include how we view history, God, the value of mankind, and morality. What should disturb students of the Bible is how these shifts have interfered with our ability to study scripture. We have now given birth to so many different theological stances on how Genesis should be interpreted, all in the name of reconciling Christian faith with what our culture holds as true. The problem with this is that in Genesis, the purpose, the reasons for Jesus Christ are laid out. That's what we risk changing or explaining away. From the pages of Genesis, we were meant to draw out our intrinsic value, the worth of mankind. We were supposed to understand why there is death and suffering in this fallen world. We were supposed to see God's judgment and his unrelenting love. If death, an essential part of evolution, was the creative process that God used to make humans, 
then how could he rightly say the wages of sin is death? And why would Christ himself appear to teach Genesis as historical fact? If we discard or alter the foundations of Christian theology, what are we left with? Would we be stripping integrity from the gospel message? In your theology, how far are you willing to go? Are you really after truth or just acceptance? Time to explore the wise guys from the Bible, and they're all around us. Well, from the beginning, God set a principle of proclamation and pronouncement upon our universe. Now, this principle flows from heaven. God spoke the universe into existence according to the Bible, and he commands creation to come to be. Now, God imparts this speaking power to Adam, humanity's first father. When God brings the animals to the man, he admonishes Adam, Name the animals, name the creatures, letting the man pronounce those sounds upon animal life, thereby making them unique, each from each other. Now, after the fall of man, his mouth becomes under the influence of Satan, whose mouth he believed, and the world would never be the same. It would be under a curse, and we would be wise guys if we place a daily mouth watch over what we say and only speak words of life into our world. Genesis 2, 15 through 24. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 24. Anybody who says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is not living in this world. They're not living in a real world. They're in a fantasy world. Yet we were taught that as young people in school. The mouth has power. Remember that in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that Satan is represented here as a snake. He's a snake. He has no arms. He has no legs. He does all of his damage with his mouth. Pronouncements and the power of the mouth is an amazing thing. The Bible says in Genesis 1, God spoke the universe into existence. So today we're going to be talking about mouth watch, not mouth wash. Mouth wash is what you do when it's over with. Mouth Watch, W-A-T-C-H, watch your mouth, put a guard over my mouth, O Lord. And for this one, we generate the understanding and the wisdom from Genesis chapter 2, and we begin with verse 15. Here is what the Bible says in the scripture as we focus on our study today. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying... 
of every tree of the garden you may eat, may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. Now that brings us to a very interesting study-wise point, and that is this. God does not place us in the temptation world or the tempting world to be devoured by its pronouncements, but rather he does so that we might overcome it by pronouncing words of life on the world. Now listen, it is easy for us to discover and to find critical people who are putting people down, making fun of everybody, making fun of Christianity, or making fun of, uh, making jokes on people, exploiting people, using their names and slandering them publicly. This is all the rage in talk radio and all the rage in the comedy central channels of today. But the truth is that for those who decide and make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, their mouth and how they speak and what they say is to be something totally different than this world offers. We are to bring words of life into a world of darkness. Now let's continue on because as we focus on this, we learn something else from verse 18 of chapter 2. Here is the Bible. So the Bible continues, and the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper for him comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. What an amazing thing. That's fascinating. God wants man to speak out their names. And then whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. God committed himself to what man pronounced. And so Adam gave names to all of the cattle. You know, he did to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But you know, it says for Adam, there was not a found, uh, comparable uh, mate found for him. Now that brings us to the second point of wisdom and study wise, I want to bring up. God commands that we speak words of life into the creation too, but God made us. This is very, very important. He made us for fellowship. He commands we speak words of life into the creation and proclaim his healing and helping name in its midst. Now there's many people that can swear. There's many people that can curse. That's not hard to do. You naturally curse. But for somebody to speak words of healing to somebody else, for somebody to speak words of constructive uh, building up, this is unique and this is different. And uh, how many times do you see that reported on the news? On the news, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the mantra. But the truth is that God calls his people, those who are followers of the Bible and those who love him, to speak differently, to be different, to speak words of hope. The Bible says in Proverbs that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know, when you say to someone, oh, you're so stupid or whatever, you're pronouncing upon them things that God does not want you to pronounce upon them. We must be careful with our mouth, beloved. Now is the good one. I love this one. Here it is in verse 21. It says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs, that is Adam's rib. He closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman. And he brought her to the man and Adam said, here's what Adam pronounces upon the woman. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has taken, was taken out of the man. So verse 24 says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is the very beginning of the Bible. And so our study wise point is fascinating. God made us for fellowship with him, to speak with him and for conversation with each other. Now listen carefully. Marriages, powerful marriages grow on godly conversations and uplifting words. You know, I was recently uh, with someone and, and they were troubled because their child was staying at someone's house and that particular person, uh, that child had been exposed to a raging, venomous argument of rage between the husband and the wife. And for three hours, the child had cried and experienced the torrent of destruction and destroying words. And you know, I believe that those words did more damage than you could have done even physically. Uh, beloved, if we are to follow God, if we are to make proclamations of truth about marriage as believers in Jesus Christ in this world, then we need to get our act together. We need to learn what it means to have marriages that are teams built together to uplift one another and to recognize God's anointing on both husband and wife, for the two shall become one flesh. This is wisdom.
there are a lot of events that happen if, if within the first three chapters of Genesis that have become really touch points for storms about theology. So right now, you and I are actually going to explore this idea of the original sin. The first four chapters of Genesis lay out the foundation of the theology of the Bible. A key element of this foundation is the rejection of the central relationship of creation by humanity, the relationship between God and man. Mankind could have chosen to live with God on earth or chosen to know life without God, which would ultimately mean death. One cannot stay alive separated from the source of life. This choice of God or the self was demonstrated in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Humanity could eat from any tree except that one, their choice. Whenever the Hebrew words good and evil are used together in the Old Testament, they form a saying that means all-encompassing, the good, the inferior, and anything in between. Paired with the Hebrew word for knowledge, which means knowledge gained through the senses, and we have a tree whose eaten fruit would provide experiential knowledge of the inferior, of disobedience. With the first self-centered disobedient act, mankind experienced separation from God. They chose something against him and have literally ingested sin. This idea of ingesting reappears later in the scripture. Just like Adam and Eve ingested corruption through eating the forbidden fruit, mankind is now seen to ingest the word of God to bring healing. Psalm 1911 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jeremiah 15 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them. Later, Jesus Christ uses this idea of ingesting. He refers to himself as the bread of life and says that humanity must figuratively eat his sacrifice, his body and blood. We are forgiven by figuratively ingesting life like Adam and Eve ingested sin. What is prophecy, really? What makes a prophet in today's modern world? Is there really such a thing as prophecy or a prophet in today's modern world? Why does God use prophets in the Bible? In the last two years, many so-called prophets, many of the biblical prophets they claim, have predicted the end of time and all kinds of events, but much of it has not come true. Join the quick study on air ministry team as they tackle the difficult subject of biblical prophecy and biblical prophets in today's world. Are they real according to the Bible? This one hour DVD begins with a careful look at prophecy according to the Bible. Then the last half hour questions are answered from many people all over the world who called in during the recording process of this program. To get your copy today, video DVD of Prophecy, What Is It According to the Bible, send $25 or more to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. The United States send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. It's a new year, it's a new plan, it's a new deal going on here in the midway part of the program. Mm -hmm. Now we, we lost the kids, but we're here together, but we really didn't lose them, they're on another really. part. It's actually only about 15 feet away from <laughs> that's us, right. but, but to you, it looks like they're in some other setting. And Corey, by the way, that's my Jeep, Corey, just saying. Uh, <laughs> you're Jeep. laying claim to it? Yes, I am, it's my <laughs> Jeep. It's a 1950, I don't think that's the way it works. 1951 Willys, I bought it two years ago for like 50 bucks, it's my Jeep. Anyway. It was um, a few more years ago than that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually it was about actually mm -hmm. it was about six years ago. Mm -hmm. Cost me Does more to run. tow it here. Yeah. Been sitting in the studio. So what we did over the the work time here is we took the junk in the studio and made it a set. Anyway, looks good, Corey, and uh, you're gonna have a chance to answer this question, Corey. Uh, are you ready? I'm gonna try. I think we're I'm ready. Try. Okay. <laughs> well you ready? I'm ready. Here's how it works. Do you know what the very first metal in the Bible was the very first metal that was mentioned. Mm. Now, the way this works is we have an option 
on in the air team who can answer the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Paul said that our Lord said it is more blessed to give than receive. So I give the answer to this question to Corey. You know, hmm. I think that sounds very convenient for you to be able to quote that. Well, but you know, I, I will try. I'm I'm thinking that it, this occurs in the genealogies, um, and I think that the answer is bronze. Bronze would be a very good answer, but it's not the right. But one? it's not the right answer, okay. and probably because you're not thinking of this material as metal. And the very first metal that was mentioned is actually gold. Oh. And that's mentioned in oh. Genesis chapter 2. Now, if you had known that answer, I think sometimes you defer when you don't think that you, you have the so, right eh? answer. Don't you think? That's what I suspect. What do you However, think? can I just give a little bit more? Please do. Did you know? Because I think this is quite fascinating. So, the, the first metal mentioned in the Bible in Genesis is gold. Now, do you know what the last mentioned metal is in the Bible. Is it gold? What do you think? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking gold because I think we're just in the Bible because we're, we're, we're mentioning the streets mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. We're into the walls. We're into the, the settings of the gates. It's got to be gold. You got it. Absolutely. Yes. Revelation 21 verses 15, 18 and 21 talk about gold. There you go. So we have gold being the first mentioned in the Bible and gold being the last mentioned in the Bible. Interesting. I think that's great. Yep. And you've mentioned all the other things. The, the city actually was measured with a reed or a rod made of? Gold. Gold. And gold, of course, is uh, interwoven in the priestly garments as well. And it's the sign of a th royal authority. Mm -hmm. Uh, blue in the priestly garments, of course, represents uh, authority in the heavens. Gold is the royal authority, and scarlet is the sacrificial authority. It's very interesting how that's woven into mm -hmm. that, and, and we'll get to that in the book of Exodus. That's fascinating. Isn't it? Though? And Just of course, a something. from science, we know that gold over years will deteriorate into lead, into a worthless metal. However, that particular metal, lead, is what you use to protect yourself from what? Radiation deadly radiation. So lead is not all bad. Mm -hmm. It protects you from deadly radiation. Fascinating stuff. We, mm -hmm. we could go off on that, but we, we don't want to do the Chuck Thurston thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, Corey, gold. Uh, how important is gold in ancient Egypt? Oh my goodness, ancient Egypt loved gold. Most of the statues that you see um, that we find today um, were actually at one point covered in gold and they've just been looted. It's been uh, taken for other purposes. They would uh, cover whole rooms, much like Solomon's uh, temple, um, in, in gold, in gold plating. The tombs sometimes of the, of the wealthy would be covered in gold. A good example is some of the stuff from Tutankhamun. Uh, his, his, some of the things that you will see from his tomb um, have been preserved, still covered in lots of gold. So the reason that, like a lot of the reasons we don't have some of the details in archaeology because the tombs have been raided is because inside of those tombs were heirlooms and various objects of worship that were made of gold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Corey, the question would be, in Tutankhamun's case, what do you think? How much gold was in there and what do you think it'd be worth? Uh, it's worth a lot. I can't remember off the top of my head how much gold was, was actually found in there, but there's the, the famous mask, uh, which, is, which is all gold. Um, yeah, they would cover lots of things in gold. They would make it not out of gold, and they would, would pound it much like uh, the Ark of the Covenant and some of the temple artifacts uh, from Solomon's temple covered in gold. So. so it's kind of a tacit belief, Janice, that gold represents wealth or authority in mm -hmm. wealth. And I find it interesting that at the beginning of the Bible, of course, mentioned where there is gold. It's a certain kind of gold that's, that's mentioned right. there. Mm -hmm. Where the Garden of Eden is gold. a good mm -hmm. gold. Yeah, it's fact. It's it's kind of interesting how it's placed in the Hebrew. And then, of course, at the end would be in the Greek. Uh, but it's talking in Revelation about right. the streets of gold, the rod of gold, the angel uses. Well, here's the three verses, actually. If you want to write them down, it's Revelation 21, verse 15. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city its gates and its walls. Revelation 21, 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. This is interesting. The gold that's clear or see-through is fascinating. So Carry clear. On. And Revelation 21, 21, the last time gold is mentioned in the Bible, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. 
and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. The street of the city, pure gold again like transparent glass. A different mm -hmm. kind of gold being mentioned here. A lot of people think it's allegorical, of course. We don't know what we're dealing with here, but it's fascinating that it is gold. All right, that's very interesting. Remember that uh, you, your support in this program keeps us being able to present this each and every day. We are supported by viewers just like you. And if you'd like to make an offering, please uh, note the address. It's on the screen. Uh, and please pray about it and consider calling today as well. Uh, we do need to develop partners for the year 2013 to keep us going. We still have much to do. Let's study on. Today in our Wise at Work segment, we learned that the most dangerous and powerful tool the human being has is endowed with speech. Our words actually create the world in which we live. So today, let's learn to season our speech with the Word of God. Let us heal and not harm with our words. Let us help and not hamper those around us. As we conclude on our Wise Up segment today, we look at Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Here is a portion of that scripture. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. That's our Wise Up segment. I encourage you to read it for yourself in the book of Proverbs and meditate on it and study it. Wise counsel, I will give you the counsel that I receive from the Word of God. The Bible is clear in what it says, that the world is in the shape that it's in because of sin, not because of God. God did not make the world this way, sin did. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Beloved, I encourage you today, come to Christ, come to Jesus. Are you frustrated with hopelessness? Are you uh, torn up by all the terrorism of the world? The good news is that there is going to come an end to all of this. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And God has promised you a spot in it. He's chosen you, but you must choose him only if you decide. Come to Jesus and pray and say, Lord, I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I give you my life today. Help me now. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. Remember that when you subscribe to Twitter or YouTube, even Facebook, you'll get my daily commentary on Wise Up from the Book of Proverbs. To find out more, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Our website again is BibleDiscoveryTV.com.